Have you ever wondered why so many people are gay these days? So let me get this straight. So traditionalists, people being born before 1946, only 1.7% of them are part of the LGBTQ community. Baby boomers are at 2.7%. Gen X is 3.3%. Millennials born from 1981 to 1996 are 11.2%. And Gen Z, kids born from 1997 to 2004, 20%. One out of five, really? It, that, that's really naturally, that's how they were. Have you ever wondered why there are so many genders all of a sudden? I'm Cody, pronouns E M er, er, or Z Zen Zer Zer, or really any neo pronouns that aren't Z her her. Now don't get me wrong, I've got plenty of gay friends, and I'm in the camp of you can do whatever you want with your life as long as you don't hurt others. But it's still a question worth asking, why is there so much gender fluidity these days? Why now? Some say it's natural, some say it's cultural, but in actuality, there's a good chance that at least part of it might be chemical. This is Dr. Shanna Swan, who's a renowned statistician, and back in the 90s, she was tasked by the National Academy of Sciences to investigate whether or not sperm count was declining. At first, she knew nothing about the subject. She didn't have a strong opinion on it, and that's why she thinks she was asked to do this, because she was unbiased. So she took the job. One of the first things we did was to look at this paper that had come out a few years earlier out of Denmark. And this paper was alarming because it said that sperm count had dropped 50% in the prior 50 years. Okay? It came out in 92. Mm. All right. And so the committee asked me as a statistician, which is what my doctorate is in, to look at this and tell the committee whether this is something they could, you know, consider for their work on the, you know, in this committee. So I looked at the paper and I have to say I was not impressed. Why weren't you impressed? Well, first of all, it was very thin in terms of number of words and pictures and data. And the data that were there, if I had a graph, I could show it to you but, but you've seen it in I think in yes. maybe yeah and a lot of the data were in recent years they were kind of spotty over the time period and more importantly perhaps there were not you know any of the factors that we worry about which might cause an erroneous decline none of those were considered this is from the Concrete Podcast, by the way, which has just been rebranded to the Danny Jones Podcast. I'm a huge fan, I love Danny's interviews, and you should definitely subscribe with the link below. Because Dr. Swan was not happy with that study, she dedicated six months to investigate practically every single study out there on sperm count to see if there was indeed something here. Somebody approaching this might think, well, okay, that went down because, you know, in more recent years, the men were older. That could make it down somewhat. Actually, sperm count doesn't decline dramatically with age, so that might be a small factor. Maybe the men are more stressed. That's probably happening. Mm. And stress actually does lower sperm count. Okay. And the men could have been more obese, and obesity lowers sperm count. And maybe most importantly, you might ask, well, maybe the way we count sperm has changed so that in recent years, the counting method counts lower. You know, methods change and maybe they're not exactly the same over the 50 years, right? And finally, there was the question of who are these men? And maybe if you think about, you can't ask a man on the street to give a sperm sample, right? So right. a man has to volunteer and he has to usually have a motivation to do that. And maybe he's doing that because he's gonna get a vasectomy, then he has very good sperm count, right? Because he's had a lot of children. Mm -hmm. Or maybe he's doing that because he's having trouble conceiving and then he has low sperm count. So the selection of the population is really important. Right. right? So there were 61 studies and so I took out of those 61 studies, I got them, retrieved them, looked through them, and took out of them any information I had on these and other relevant factors. I also took out what country they were conducted in and, and so on and so forth. So all the details I could about the study. And then I and my colleagues put them in a you know spreadsheet <laughs> and ran a more complicated analysis than had been done before. Mm. So we called it multivariable because we had all these variables in there, right? We're not just looking at the decline. And Danny, it was staggering to see that after all that work of six months and <laughs> accounting for all these factors, the slope changed from minus 0.93 to minus 0.95. It didn't change at all. Right. That's million sperm per milliliter okay. per year. And wow, I just like, I went back to the committee and I said, I can't make this go away. 
it looks like it's real. It's so, I mean, it's so unusual in science to see that, that consistency, you know. So I thought, okay, this is something I really have to look at. And so she began running studies herself, with her most important study in 1999, where she measured the sperm count of men at sperm donor clinics in four cities, Los Angeles, Columbia, Minneapolis, and New York. What I did, I, I selected four cities in the United States with different environments, and I recruited the men in exactly the same way, so there wasn't that problem with selection bias, and I can, I'll tell you in a minute how we did that. And then we measured the sperm exactly the same way in each of the four centers. You can't get semen from a man on the street. You can't get a random semen sample. Right. You just can't do it. Okay, so I decided that the group that absolutely always goes for medical care is pregnant women almost always mm -hmm. right so i decided to recruit pregnant women in order to recruit their husbands okay. kind of devious maybe but we weren't asking them for a lot we were asking them the women for a urine sample and a questionnaire and a blood sample but they give that anyway when they're pregnant mm -hmm. you know so it wasn't really uh, an, an imposition and then from the husbands we wanted, in addition, a semen sample, right? So we got over 900 men and women to do this. Yeah, approximately equally distributed amongst our centers. And then we looked at their semen quality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what we found was absolutely alarming and unexpected. And what we found was that the men living in central Missouri, in Columbia, had half half as many moving sperm as men in Minneapolis. Wow. That's what I said. Wow. And is that, that's obviously due to... Wait, some wait. That, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. We don't know. We can, don't sorry, jump there. Okay. But your question, I know where you're going. Mm -hmm. You're going to say... The agri agriculture right. and pesticides. She suspected that the high use of pesticides in Colombia, the agricultural capital of the U.S., was causing lower than normal sperm count. It turns out, very luckily for us, that you can measure pesticide exposure in the urine. And I remember I told you that we got the men's urine. Yes. So, and we got that at the same time they gave a semen sample. Okay. All right? Right. So we could ask, okay, are the levels of pesticides in the men's urine at that time when they gave the semen sample related to their sperm quality at that time? And the answer was yes. And we found five pesticides that were very different between men who had very good semen quality and very poor semen quality in uh, Missouri, in our, our center in Missouri. Five different pesticides. Yeah. Wow. Dr. Swan had found the smoking gun. Pesticides, specifically the hormone disrupting chemicals found in pesticides, was what was causing the sperm count in Colombia to drop. But it wasn't just adult men that was affected. Women and even unborn babies were being affected by these chemicals. And it didn't take long for Dr. Swan to narrow down the type of chemicals that was causing this. Phthalates. 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 And phthalates are everywhere. Phthalates are in soda bottles, shampoo, lotion, perfume, flame retardants, clothing. It's literally in everything. You are in contact with phthalates pretty much all day long. And once you touch them, those phthalates get absorbed into your skin. These chemicals are so dangerous to our hormones and fertility that it's not only annihilating sperm count, but as Dr. Swan puts it, these chemicals can quote, interfere with complex biochemical pathways in the brain in ways that may affect how a person expresses their gender, end quotes. That quote, the changes in sexual development taking place all over the world appear to have been accompanied by an apparent rise in gender fluidity, end quotes. At its minimum, phthalates are making you infertile, it's making men's penises shorter, and perhaps it's making us more gay. And at its worst, this dropping sperm count can lead to the extinction of the human species. If it were to continue on its present course, well, that's a difficult thing to project, of course, but just mathematically, if you'd extended the line, it does hit zero in 2045. So that's the median sperm count. That means half of men would have no sperm. And yet, the companies producing these chemicals are not going to stop anytime soon. After further investigation, Dr. Swan discovered that if a pregnant mother was exposed to phthalates during the first trimester of pregnancy, her son would go on to develop a misformed small penis. Sometimes called the taint, or the gooch, or yes. the grundle. <laughs> Very familiar with the gooch. 
when the mother, let's say rat, was exposed to a phthalate, let's just say, I'm going to give you a name, diethylhexyl phthalate, D-E-H-P, just so I can talk about it. And that's probably the most, the worst actor in this class <laughs> for lowering testosterone. When the mother was exposed to that in early pregnancy, then her male offspring developed smaller penises, smaller scrotum, testes were less likely to descend, and there were internal changes as well, changes to the vas deferens, and and so epididymis and so on. And this distance that they'd been measuring for years, but which I and no other epidemiologists had not heard about, the distance from the anus to the genitals became shorter. Mm. And they called it the phthalate syndrome. When the mother was given phthalates in her food, at that time, testosterone is surging, that the surge is wiped out. It's Mm. eliminated. The graph is very dramatic. Right. It's just completely flat in males, genetic males. So that says that that male needs that testosterone at that time to develop normally. So it's not about just avoiding phthalates in plastic as an adult man. We actually get our hormones affected in the womb. So if a mother is exposed to phthalates between days 18 and 21 of gestation, if the mother is exposed during that very exact window, this burst of testosterone will be blocked and the male baby will be born with things like a smaller penis, a shorter ADG, and just have like general trouble producing sperm and, and all that good stuff. It's such a delicate thing and it only takes a tiny bit amount of phthalates to block the hormones. Some scientists say it's like the equivalent of a drop of oil in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's the ratio we're working with here, and it's like that small amount of phthalates can make major damage. This is Robert Oliver, by the way. He's the founder of Top Shelf Ground, which you might have seen on Amazon. He's a great friend, and he's always been obsessed over optimizing his health. And the craziest part of all this is that being exposed to these chemicals before you're born won't just affect the way you look, but it can actually change your brain chemistry and how you behave later on in life. My suspicion is that just as the generals differentiate into male and female, the brain also does. One study showed that when male monkey babies were exposed to BPA, a phthalate found in plastic, they showed more feminine behaviors like clinging to their mothers and social exploration. They can produce rats, and as I told you, that want to have males want to have sex with other males really yes that can be produced with the pesticide we talked about before atrazine right and right this was a study that was done on fish and frogs as well right right frogs wow. particularly yeah frogs right oh, yes they made homosexual frogs phthalates can also make girls act more masculine one study showed that little girls who were exposed to dioxin exhibited more masculine behaviors than girls who weren't you're not totally doomed if you're exposed to phthalates Phthalates are water soluble and only last in your system for around 24 hours when you're exposed. But most people literally always have phthalates in their system, either from breathing in pesticides all day, washing their hands with soap, drinking from plastic bottles, and the list goes on. Phthalates are in carpeting body care products like body wash and deodorant. Fragrance may contain, what does it mean may contain? It might contain up to like 20 or 30 percent of phthalates. Wow. And we found a lot of parabens. They're in your clothes, in your furniture, store receipts on the inside of soda cans. Polyester is polyethylene tera phthalate. Be careful with coffee, be careful with soda cans, those aluminum cans. Yeah, those are lined in plastics too. Phthalate containing plastic or BP, bisphenol containing plastic like bis- BPS or BPF. So plastics, plastics everywhere. Uh, again, with the blankets, they snake them into perfumes. These things are freaking everywhere. Like I just said, they're ubiquitous. And even if you did manage to escape all these chemicals, our modern lifestyle is already making us infertile anyways. Back in the early 1900s, most men spent all day working on farms. They're constantly in motion. This kept their testosterone and sperm count high. But today's men spend hours sitting at a cramped desk staring at a screen, only to go home to stare at more screens. And while they've numbed themselves with porn and social media, and stuff their faces with fake foods. And this is destroying their sperm. I was shocked to see this, like, screens affect sperm. So that's kind of bizarre. Staring at your phone or watching too much TV can yeah, affect your sperm count. Yeah, that was interesting, yeah. yeah. That, that being a couch potato, actually. Right. It's, it's tied to that. Sitting so you're down. watching your screen, you're not outside exercising. Mm. You're not riding your bike. Okay. You're not, right? So, so these are never it, one factor at a time. It you doesn't know? have so much to do with, like, the lights going into your retinas. It's more to do with, like, when people are connected to screens, they're sitting down, they're inactive. That's right. Sugary sodas lower sperm. 
Cigarettes lower sperm. Meat and dairy from cows are fed estrogens. Lower sperm. Tylenol lower sperm. And the list goes on. So right at the top there, you want to avoid foods with any pesticides. So any grains sprayed with pesticides, corn, a lot of oats grown in the U.S. have glycophosphate, non-organic wheat. And moving down that list, we've got things like Tylenol, lowering sperm count, biking. So even if it's just you know a couple hours a week, that can lower your sperm count by 34%. Saunas, hot tub, any kind of extreme heat in general can lower sperm count. It's actually one of the worst things. Alcohol, especially if you're drinking alcohol like you're... Uh, like a sixth grader, so drinking it early in life can really, really stunt development and manhood. There's a lot of stuff that society tends to deem healthy and like acceptable. So you see, you look around and see everyone doing it. Like how many people eat oatmeal, right? And at the end of the day, those are actually destroying our health. And the crazy thing is that all this destruction to your hormones can be passed down through entire generations. So if you want to prevent all this damage to your sperm and hormones, the absolute best thing you can do is get your own farm, grow your own food, and clock out of modern society completely which is actually starting to become appealing. But obviously, that is not going to work for most of us. So you want to do what you can. You want to only eat organic. You want to cut out as much plastic out of your life as possible. We're talking food containers, utensils, water bottles. And ideally, you want to cut out things like conventional deodorant, body wash, shampoo, lotion, and swap them out for more natural versions because these chemicals are very easily absorbed through the skin. And obviously, if you're still eating fake processed food and not exercising, what are you doing? Just start with those and you'll get like 50 to 80% of the benefits. Those are the baseline things you need to be doing. But if you want to boost, you might want to check out Rob's brand Kingmaker with the link below. Kingmaker is the testosterone supplement to end all testosterone supplements. It has 12 clinically studied ingredients in the right doses, so it actually makes a difference when you take it unlike most fake supplements. It does not have a proprietary blend, so you can actually see what's in it and what amounts on the label. And because Rob uses real ingredients in the right doses, it costs Rob as much money to make Kingmaker as what other fake testosterone supplements are selling for. So Kingmaker is not cheap. But that is also exactly what you're looking for in a supplement like this. I take Rob's products myself every day. I love them. That's why I'm happy that Kingmaker is sponsoring this video. And you can pick up some for yourself with the link below. Because if you don't do anything about your sperm count and hormones, this destruction is going to be passed down to your kids and your kids' kids. The World Economic Forum keeps telling us that our population is out of control. There's too many people on Earth. And us dirty, overpopulated humans are destroying the environments. But Dr. Swan's studies paint a different picture. For fertility, for PCOS, for miscarriage, for testosterone, they're all declining at at least 1% per year. You know, Tom, when I say to people 1% per year, they go, yeah, that's a lot. Then I say 50 years, that's how far back we've looked. That's 50%, yeah. at least. See, she says we're at a tipping point, where fertility will go down enough to cause the population to shrink. She says that if male fertility keeps dropping at 1% per year like it is right now, in a few years, median sperm count will literally be zero. Let me say that again. Median sperm count will literally go to zero. And the reason for this is because low sperm count can actually be passed down through generations. If you have phthalates in your sperm and you get a woman pregnant, that embryo is way more likely to develop malformed genitals, undescended testicles, and yes, even a micro penis. Yeah, so it's crazy, but like phthalates definitely alter the DNA of the sperm. And so it like quite literally changes the quality. So if you have genetically weak sperm creating an embryo, that embryo will be genetically weak and it'll grow up a genetically weak boy or girl. You see what I'm saying with all this? It's faulty DNA that is created with phthalate exposure and then that's just passed down. And it's something that your great, great grandchildren can be exposed to at the end of the day, right? And that's kind of the whole, we've gotten so good at keeping people alive and functioning, longer lifespans, but less quality of life, that this is like textbook that, right? Weaker sperm is created, weaker humans are created. We've gotten good enough to keep them alive and, and let them reproduce, right? So they're not dying off in a way that would have you know, previously happened. And we have generations of weak individuals. Your son will grow up with lower sperm quality as well and will probably have trouble having kids in the future. He will then pass on this faulty DNA to his son. And this is how the male fertility death spiral starts. It's a slow, invisible chemical extinction of our species. And this chemical extinction is already happening in the animal kingdom. One group of male polar bears in Greenland who were exposed to high amounts of pesticides has super low testosterone levels, short penises, and smaller than normal testicles. In a pesticide contaminated lake in Canada, alligators only had a 5% hatch rate, when usually it's 85%, and the minks who lived near the lake also had abnormally small penises. And bald eagles exposed to DDT are laying eggs so thin that when they send on them, the eggs instantly crack. 
Phthalates and our horrible lifestyles are slowly killing us off. And the big companies who manufacture these chemicals know this. They are perfectly aware with how dangerous these chemicals are. But do you think they're going to stop? When did this stuff start getting into our food supply? Has that been estimated? The growth of these chemicals tracks with the growth of the petrochemical industry because they're made from petrochemical byproducts. Two of the biggest sources of phthalates are pesticides and plastics. Both are made from the byproducts of the oil and gas industry. And guess what? Plastic raked in around $130 billion just last year, while pesticides raked in around $80 billion. So put yourself in the shoes of these corporations. Are they going to stop? No. If you're in their shoes, you're going to keep the plastic making machine oiled and running for as long as you possibly can. And if you're one of these companies in the US, you're actually in luck because the EPA doesn't really have the money to regulate your toxic phthalates. Why would they spend their valuable time and money on an obscure invisible chemical that isn't visibly hurting people right this instant when you can focus on the more popular chemicals like carcinogens, for example? Because there are so many dangerous chemicals around, the EPA pretty much lets any chemical be used in manufacturing. Only once a chemical has been proven to be toxic, will it then be reviewed and hopefully banned. But this reviewing period can take decades, sometimes an entire century. And if one of the chemicals is shown to be toxic, like BPA was 11 years ago, the great thing about chemistry is that you can just reformulate the chemical composition just a tiny bit, then you can slap on a new name to it, and voila, it's legal again. When in practice, it's basically the same exact toxic thing. The reality is though, BPA got a bad rap. And so manufacturers seized on this and they said, well, I'm gonna sell BPA free everything. They took out BPA, but they replaced it with its chemical cousin, BPS or bisphenol S. The toxicological profile looks exactly the same, darn near similar to BPA. So how do we fix this? Do we A, stop using plastics? B, stop using pesticides? Or C, do we keep using all of those things and just make artificial sperm? If you chose C, ding, 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 you would be correct. Picture this, the year is 2045, men across the world are all infertile, so what do people turn to? Well, it sounds horrifying, but scientists are already experimenting with lab-grown sperm. A French startup company says it's reached a breakthrough creating human sperm in a lab for the first time. Scientists say they have succeeded in creating functioning sperm. Ah yes, lab-grown sperm. And this artificial sperm will probably be used to grow artificial humans in an artificial womb. But if you don't want to opt into this dystopia, you want to do all the stuff we talked about earlier. But by far the most important thing you want to do, especially if you're a guy that has low testosterone right now, is to avoid these scummy telehealth companies like Hims. You've probably seen ads for Hims before. Hims uses their cute little branding to prey on insecure men with messaging like trouble getting hard, feeling stressed or burnt out, want to last longer in bed. You don't have to change your diet, exercise, or get more sunlight. No, just get prescribed our terrible pharmaceutical drugs online. And since these drugs only fix the symptoms of erectile dysfunction or depression and not the root cause, you'll be dependent on our drugs for life. And for that, Hims has become a billion dollar company. And Rob exposes it all in his new video that you can watch right now by clicking the card on the screen. It's a super good video if you like our videos, you are gonna love his. So click the card on the screen to watch now.